What's up everybody, welcome back to the channel. It's excellent to have you here as always and thank you for watching. A few weeks ago I published a video on 300 Blackout and why it is my favorite caliber. There of course was a vigorous debate down in the comment section down below and born from that are always some of the greatest ideas. I cannot thank you guys enough for giving me an unending supply of stuff to talk about here on the channel. Somebody said, yeah man, 300 Blackout's great. But 762 by 39 is an objectively superior cartridge. Yeah, man, I don't really think so. To be able to use the term objectively as a modifier for superior, we have to have facts and data to support our position. And today we're going to be doing an analysis of the 762 by 39 round and why there's no way in hell that it can be objectively superior to a 300 blackout round. Just pissed off the internet. Disclaimer. This is not a Soviet versus American thing. That Cold War ended a while ago. We have been fighting proxy wars with the communists ever since, but that's a debate for another day. That wall is covered in Soviet weaponry. That wall is covered in American weaponry. I like them all, and you should purchase whatever works for you. However, I think for the new consumer especially, there's a lot of stuff. Wall of information, and I think we can pick some bits out of that to give somebody a base to stand on, that's what we're gonna do here today. And to do that, I have developed a flow chart. The way I think about flow charts is we should start with a course adjustment and then neck ourselves down to a more precise point. The first criteria for filtering out of objective superiority or the lack thereof would be the priming method. So is it a rim fire cartridge or is it a center fire cartridge? This one is such a large course correction from the rest of the stack that you can basically say clear division if it is a rimfire cartridge 1860 called they want their ammunition back it's really hard to make ammo and they want to know why you keep stealing it if it is a rimfire cartridge it is old tech it is automatically inferior objectively speaking i would say that the most recognizable at least for most folks maybe you have experience with something else of the rimfire cartridges is the 22 long rifle. You'll notice if you look at that thing that there is no primer on the back of that cartridge. And basically the way that works is that priming compound is located between those two folds of brass. The hammer comes down, smashes that fold of brass between itself and either the receiver or the breech of the firearm, and it sets it off. The downside to that is that you have to get that priming compound around the circumference of the inside of that rim. And that is harder than you would think. <laughs> Every single person who uses a 22 has either had or will have a misfire and a solidly struck 22 piece of ammunition. It will happen. A rim fire cartridge is just not gonna be as good as something like a center fire cartridge. Rim fire, center fire. So let's do a check real quick. 762 by 39, center fire cartridge, put it in the good pile. The next most important criteria, and necking down even further, is case construction. And when you use that terminology, a lot of people are gonna go steel cased versus brass cased. And it is my contention that that crap don't matter nearly as much as the internet would have you believe. And that's where we're gonna pick up after we hear a word from our sponsor, which is Sonoran Desert Institute. Have you ever considered a career in the firearms industry? or wanted to learn more about a particular discipline as it relates to guns. Perhaps you're under intense pressure from your family to go to college, but you realize that's a really bad investment because the only things that you're good at are guns and basket weaving. If any of that is you, then a course of study at SDI might be right up your alley. What did you major in in school? Guns. Sonoran Desert Institute is a DEAC accredited online college focusing on programs and courses pertinent to firearms. So if you're into gun repair, ballistics, or learning about firearms, SDI might be something you wanna look into. They even have funding plans and payment options available for anybody who doesn't have a pile of money laying around, like most of us. So if you're interested, you can catch up with them at sdi.edu. Special thanks to SDI for making today's video possible. And most 762 by 39 ammunition is going to be steel cased just by the virtue of the manufacturing and the guns are gonna be designed to shoot that stuff. We have options. This is a Fiocchi round that is a 7.62x39 round with a brass casing on it. And this is an excellent round. It shoots little tiny groups. Even if you put it in a trash gun like that Wasser 10 over there, it will shoot little tiny groups. However, it is my opinion that you should not shoot brass cased ammunition out of your AK-47s. If you've ever fired an AK-47, or a SKS or something like that, 
you'll see the steel casings go like 40 or 50 feet. If you put brass cased ammunition in that gun, those casings will basically fall out of the side of the gun. What is happening is that casing smacks the ejector and the ductility of the brass absorbs a substantial proportion of the energy and basically it doesn't bounce nearly as well since it's made out of brass. Making it a steel or brass doesn't really matter that much. What we're talking about is case construction is how the thing is dimensionally situated. So the first thing that I would look at as far as case construction is concerned is, is the cartridge rimmed? And to answer that on the 762 by 39 round, sorta, it's pseudo rimmed. And let me explain. This is a rimmed cartridge. You can see that it has a wide rim there on the back. This is a 762 by 54 R round. This is what would be fired out of the SVD or the famous Mosin Nagant. Another good example of a rim cartridge would be the 303 British round. You can see that there is a chunky rim there. For contrast purposes, this is a 308 round or a 762 by 51 round. You'll notice that there is no protruding rim off of that thing. This is important because if you take two rimmed cartridges and stack them, they interfere with each other. You are careful to put the next one so that the rim stacks like this. If you do not do that properly, and this cartridge ends up like this, well, when that bolt comes forward to load it, it is going to hang up. It is going to pull both cartridges forward. This one is gonna dead end on the magazine or the receiver of the firearm, and you're gonna lock your gun up. gun up. It's called rim lock, and this is the reason we don't use rim cartridges anymore. Now, back to the 7.62 by 39 round. It has a pseudo rim, as in, it's not really rimmed, but it gives the appearance of being rimmed. If I take this caliper here and I size it on the case body, you can see how much is sticking out right there. You'll notice that when I go to pull on this, that rim gets stuck and cannot come through. If we do a comparison between this and like 300 Blackout, for instance, locked on the largest dimension at the back of the case, and this thing is going to go right through each time without a problem. Does not get hung up on any rim. Back to these guys, rim lock. Two 7.62 by 39 rounds and a female blonde hair. No interference. Run right by each other. What presents itself as a rim on the 7.62 by 39 round is actually a taper. And it is one of the strongest arguments for 7.62 by 39. It is a taper lock, like you would see in some suppressor designs. It is basically a gas check. And when you give just a little bit of force on the back of something that is shaped like that, it's gonna pop right out. So not rimmed, we're gonna call it pseudo rimmed, put it in the good pile. We're gonna come back to that taper here in a bit because there, there's gonna be something else that we need to talk about. The other criteria on a casing is going to be whether or not, or not it is shouldered. This is a 4570 round. You'll notice that it does not have a shoulder on it. It is called a straight walled cartridge. And the straight walled cartridge is going to be a less efficient design than say a comparable bottleneck cartridge or a shouldered cartridge. This is a 458 SOCOM. These are almost ballistically equivalent. This puts out a little bit more even though it is smaller because it uses geometry to get that done. Basically, you've got a rocket cone set up there that dictates how the powder burn rate impacts the projectile. Wham bam, thank you ma'am. Persistent burn. 7.62 by 39, shouldered. Put it in the good pile. We have thoroughly identified that we are in the good pile and we're now sorting through the good pile. So let's revisit that taper there for a second. So the great thing about that taper that we mentioned on the 7.62 by 39 is that it comes out of the breech really easily. But when you go to stack them, and this is the proper magazine for a 762 by 39 gun. I don't care what anybody else says. This is the correct magazine to use, an AK-47 magazine. Everything else is a bastardization to make it work. And they usually don't work very well. This is a 300 Blackout magazine. And when you compare the two of them, you can see that the footprint is substantial. And some people are like, oh, don't be a... Objectively speaking, a bigger thing fits fewer of them in a defined space than a smaller thing. This is not hard. You can fit fewer of these on your person than you can these. Necking it down even further, bullet construction. I have to be careful here because I'm gonna speak broadly 
and then go back to the 7.62 bit 39. There are two, nah, three distinctions, nah, more, three distinctions that we're going to cover as far as bullet construction is concerned. There are plated bullets, there are bonded bullets, and then there are machine bullets. A plated bullet is going to be a piece of lead that has been electroplated with some kind of substance, usually copper. You can see these predominantly in like 22s and some cheap 9mm ammunition. You want the copper there because it keeps the lead from building up in your barrel. That's the only reason is you would clean your barrel. You actually want the copper in there because it keeps other things from adhering to the surface. Don't remove the copper from your barrel. If you use a plated bullet, generally speaking, that will be less than if you used a plain old lead bullet. So there's, I guess there's another one, plain old lead bullets. Plain old lead bullets, out. Not objectively superior. A plated bullet is not gonna be as good as a bonded bullet, which is a piece of metal that has been either wrapped around a piece of lead or has had lead poured into it. There is a legit piece of metal that makes up the outer coating. And then of course, you've got machine bullets that are gonna be a solid chunk of metal that has been spun down, usually made of copper, sometimes tungsten, give me a break. This is a lead core, copper jacketed, bonded bullet. This is also a bonded bullet. However, this is a lead core, steel jacketed, copper plated projectile. <laughs> There's some data that would suggest that taking a piece of steel and shoving it down a steel tube will prematurely wear it more than taking a piece of copper and ramming it down the same tube. Next would be payload. Whenever comparing two cartridges, one of the most important numbers that you can look at is the velocity and the weight. They're going to govern all the ballistic char characteristics of that round except for one, which we'll get to here in a second. Velocity and weight, in my mind, equal energy. If you compare the energy of a comparable weight 762 by 39 round to that of a 300 blackout round, you get basically the same thing. Increasing the weight of a projectile for the sake of increasing the weight of a projectile does not give you near as much impact as a lot of people think that it does. Remember, if you go back to physics, that the equation for kinetic energy is one half the mass times the velocity squared, which means that the velocity is the quintessential element of that. Increasing the mass, however, does make your ammunition heavier. That thing that I talked about that the mass and velocity don't inherently impact is the ballistic coefficient. A layman's way to describe how this thing works is the profile of the bullet is presenting to the atmosphere. It's easier to throw a spear than it is to throw a boulder. A 7.62 by 39 round does not have as good a BC as a 300 blackout round. Which brings me, in closing, to the only criteria which I believe could be used to give the 7.62 by 39 round any semblance of a leg up over the competition and that is price and availability. There is so much 7.62 by 39 ammunition on this planet that we will never shoot it all, period. There's, it's everywhere. 300 blackout, nah, a little bit harder to find. It's also pricier. I would argue being a biased individual that 300 blackout for a while was harder to manufacture than 7.62 by 39 and therefore does not have the broad acceptance as 762 by 39 because the arguably the most popular weapon in the world shoots the 762 by 39 cartridge and therefore it's gonna be cheaper to get the ammunition because it's an economies of scale thing so you could say that objectively speaking the 762 by 39 has a superior supply chain than 300 blackout does but that does not make it objectively superior. And then there are machine bullets. And I know somebody is going to get pissed because they didn't talk about their frangibles or what. It... Just, there's an exception to every rule. 